much. Um, thank you for being here. I'm just going to tell you very briefly about um, the panelists who we have today and who um, you'll be talking to. So um, the first person is uh, that you're speaking to is me. Nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm the public lead for Creative Commons USA, and I'm a lawyer who works on issues related to copyright, fair use, Creative Commons licenses and open education at the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property okay. at American University, Washington College of Law. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Peter Yazzi, uh, who is a professor emeritus of copyright law at American University, where he helped found the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Clinic and the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. Um, he is an expert on copyright law and fair use and a leader of our ongoing project work with communities to draft best practices in fair use, including for the OER community. I'm also joined by Michael Carroll, a professor of law and the director of PIGIP. He teaches and writes about intellectual property law and cyber law and is one of the founding drafters for Creative Commons. And uh, his work is generally on copyright in the digital world. I'm also joined by Prue Adler, who currently works with us at the law school on our best practices work. Prior to that, she was the Associate Executive Director of the Marrakesh Treaty, an international copyright, oh, sorry, she was a Associate Executive Director of the Association of Research Libraries. And at ARL, she worked on the Marrakesh Treaty, an international copyright treaty to facilitate access to published works for people who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. We also have Will Cross, who is the Director of Copyright and Digital Scholarship of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at the NC State University Libraries and uh, OER Research Fellow. He's trained as a lawyer and librarian and is a collaborator in our project to create this best practices for OER. We have Pernil Rip, an expert in literacy and technology integration, whose research is dedicated to developing engaged and empowered students and communities. Pernil is also the founder of the Global Read Aloud and the author of two books, Passionate Readers, and passionate learners. Carrie Russell is a senior program director and copyright specialist for the American Library Association's Public Policy and Advocacy Office in Washington, DC. Her uh, policy portfolio includes copyright licensing and accessibility, and she's also the author of two books, Copyright, an Everyday Guide for K-12 Librarians, and Complete Copyright, an Everyday Guide for Librarians. And finally, um, I'm happy to be joined by Christina Ishmael, who serves as the senior project manager of the teaching, learning, and tech team for the education policy program at New America, which allows her to support states, districts, and educators in rethinking the role of instructional materials to create deeper learning opportunities for students. Before joining New America, Christina was the K-12 Open Education Fellow at the Office of Ed Tech, where she developed and grew the Go Open movement. And I want to take a moment and thank Christina and our ongoing partnership with the education team at New America They've been our longtime collaborators, and without them, this project would not be possible. Um, so very briefly, I'm just going to let you know what we're going to cover. So Mike, if you can go ahead uh, to the slide with the agenda. Oh, so that's been taken out. So I'll just let you know what we're um, going to cover. And so first, we have uh, this introduction we're doing. We're going to talk a little bit about why questions about copyright are even sort of in this space when teachers are trying to make this transition. We're gonna hear from um, Pernil and Christina about why reading aloud is a really crucial practice for teaching and creating educational communities. And from Christina about why in this moment of transition, it's really important to carry those practices forward. Um, Peter's gonna talk about the relationship between the long history of reading aloud and copyright law and we're gonna hear from Carrie about specifically the fair use analysis that goes on in that copyright law. Uh, Will is gonna talk about questions that come up about how fair use applies in different technologies and formats and um, how you can basically think through the same questions to understand things even though the technological formats seem really different. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some specific scenarios that have come up over and over again for teachers and how to think through those in a um, copyright framework. And finally, we'll hear a little bit from Carrie about a sort of bigger perspective of how it's important to 
rely on the limitations and exceptions built into the copyright system to continue providing um, access to students for whom a day in day out lack of access is an ongoing emergency. Um, so I hope that's useful. We'll be about an hour and a half. And um, as we said at the beginning, all of the uh, notes, sorry, all of the links for the slides and for the recorded webcast and to submit more questions are in the um, original document with the guidance and um, we'll be taking questions at the end or we'll, we'll be going over questions at the end. So up next, we have Professor Michael Carroll. Great, uh, thank you so much, Meredith. And, and hello, everyone, thanks for being with us. Um, I'm a lawyer and I'm also an educator and I wanna to talk to you in both capacities. And I've, I've got five minutes, so uh, I just have a couple of preliminary things that we need to think about. There, um, as a lawyer, we think about what we do and, and when we give legal advice, it is applying the law to particular people's facts. What, what, what has prompted us to want to do this is there are a lot of people out there who claim they're not lawyers, but then are out there giving legal advice about how copyright applies to reading aloud in the online environment. And a lot of, a lot of that advice is simply wrong. Um, and it's causing turmoil, it's causing stress where it doesn't need to be. And so as attorneys, we're a little bit at a disadvantage because we cannot directly point to someone applying the law to a particular set of facts and say that's wrong. But what we can do, and, and the attorneys on this call um, have come together to, uh, to sort of forcefully put forward legal information and a legal explanation about how copyright and fair use applies to common educational practices, even as they get translated into the online environment. And this legal explanation is, is there to provide guidance and confidence that if your practices in your own classroom, in your own teaching is, is similar to the use cases that we're discussing, then, then you have fair use rights and you should feel confident. And this is regardless of what the publishers are saying is permitted or not, because fair use is your right under the copyright law to make uses of copyright, copyrighted material, regardless of, uh, of what the publisher or the copyright owner uh, wants. So think of this as the legal explanation that will uh, tell you what, what the do's and don'ts are. And there are a lot of people who want really bright line, really crisp do's and don'ts. And so when, when we tell them, well, fair use is a contextual uh, analysis, we look at why you're doing what you're doing, how you're doing it, they don't like that. So they make up their own rules. But those are made up rules. So what you're gonna hear uh, today is what the law really is and how the law really applies to common educational practices and how copyright is a more reasonable law than some people uh, present it when, when uh, on social media or otherwise you say you can't do this and you can't do that. Um, uh, and so uh, now we will periodically maybe use some qualifying language like it's probably, it's likely, I want to be clear that when, when we're using that language, it is because we can't predict what each and every use case might be. But I don't think you should take that as any signal of our lack of confidence in the, in the legal explanation that we're giving you about what fair use permits. We're just hedging on, in the sense that we can't predict each and every possible use. And there might be some unforeseen use out there that where, where there'd be an issue. But that's not we're going we're gonna to deal with the common cases and show why the common cases are perfectly legal un, under the copyright law. Um, and part of the, and, and the folks who are saying you can't do this, you can't do that, they, they might have a variety of motivations, but uh, one of the confusions that we've seen in that is that the, an under, a failure to understand that there's a big difference between a teacher recording an audio book and putting it out commercially to you know, compete with an existing audiobook, there the mere fact that you're a teacher doesn't protect you uh, from there being a problem. But that's not what's going on. We are reading aloud as part of the educational practices, and you'll hear about why it's educationally important to read aloud. And the educators in the audience are going to be, well, I know that's why I'm doing it. But as the lawyers, we say, but, but you know, the reasons why you are doing it, the educational purpose, the educational benefits are part of why we're confident this is a fair use. It's part of why we think this is exactly the kind of use that copyright law is designed to permit. Um, and so 
if you get a little impatient with us telling you why it's important, it's because it is actually part of the legal explanation. Um, now, I think that's essentially uh, my role here. I actually have to teach a class a little bit later this afternoon and won't be able to stay all the way through to the question and answers. But I, um, I'm thrilled that my colleagues uh, really took the initiative and made this happen. Uh, we hope that this is helpful. I want to take off my lawyer hat for a minute, put on my educator hat, and say, I'm one of you. I'm struggling to adapt my classroom to the online environment. I've got 72 adult learners I've got to go address in a few minutes. You've got a lot of hungry young minds with attention that's all over the place. And I just want to thank you. Thank you for all the work you're doing. And if we can at least alleviate a little bit of stress or confusion around copyright, uh, we hope that that will at least lighten the load just a little bit. But we think the work you're doing is so very important and that reading aloud is such a very important fundamental educational practice that the idea that somebody may be well-intentioned but misinformed is inhibiting teachers from doing that. Just, we can't, we can't do that. The last thing I'll say is this is not a lesson about how to do uh, copyright in a pandemic. This is a lesson about how copyright and fair use work together, period. There might be one or two things where the context of the pandemic uh, adds a little bit to the fair use analysis. But in general, most of what you're hearing today is general copyright and fair use analysis that applies to the practice of reading aloud because the purpose of doing it remains the same. The educational benefits remain the same. And that's why the law remains the same. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope the rest of the webinar goes great and, and I'll be ready, willing, and able to uh, participate in any follow-on activities that, that arise from this. Thanks, Mike. Um, next up, we have uh, Pernil Rip, who's going to talk a little bit about the purposes of reading aloud. Hi, Pernil. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, my computer does not like Zoom, so we'll make the best of it here. So the purpose of reading aloud it seems incredibly urgent right now right as we're sitting in our classrooms <laughs> created in our houses as we're trying to figure out what this remote learning looks like i have had so many educators reach out to me just wondering how can you do the read aloud and yet also abide by the and so that's what we wanted to talk about today because there are so many things that we can do with the read aloud. When we're in our classrooms, we use it to build community. We use it to instill a love of reading. We use it as a way to start inquiry units, start hard conversations, and all of the things that we hope our students and our own children will be immersed in in our classrooms. Those purposes have not changed. The read aloud is an incredible way, of course, of building in and bringing in community into these very scattered learning communities we're now sitting with. However, now more than ever, we really have to think about what are those purposes of read aloud that we can use. If you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So for right now, what I'm, oh, one back, please. For what I'm thinking about right now is that we need to still speak books together. We need to create new shared experiences within this new world that we're sitting in. And that is where Read Aloud comes in. We can continue the Read Aloud that perhaps we were already doing in our classrooms so that kids feel that they're still connected to that. We can start a new Read Aloud like I'm planning on doing as a way to build community. But we can also use short stories and picture books to create a new language together so that if we come back together or when we come back together, we can say, remember what happened in that story. It also continues our shared emphasis of the value of reading. When uh, students have an adult that they trust and hopefully have a good relationship with continues to read aloud, even in all of this craziness, it shows that we see that this whole idea of coming together through a read aloud has not left our minds. We can continue to build our community and not just rest on the community that we already had. This also gives us a chance to continue to uh, reframe and discuss the impact of the dominant culture in our society and how it influences our understanding of the 
world. Right now is a great time to start inquiry projects with students, and right now it is a great time to think about the inequities that present themselves in our world. We can do the beginnings of those conversations through our read-alouds. And so when I think about my own practice as a classroom teacher, the read-aloud was one of the first tools that I embraced in order to continue the learning that we've already done. My students can access a hard text without having to worry about whether or not they can decode it. They can connect through this text, they can ask questions, and they can also continue that comprehensive decoding, analysis, and critical thinking that we've already paved the way for. But finally, why are we doing read-alouds? My six-year-old daughter sat today and watched her kindergarten teacher read a picture book aloud to her in Spanish, and there is no way I could have replicated the smile she saw when she saw her teacher do exactly the same thing that she has done all those days in their classroom, but now coming through a computer screen, she tucked in a little closer to me and said, there's my teacher, mom. And so I think right now, as we continue to navigate all of this new, it's so important that we keep something central that we've used before, the read aloud to keep, our, uh, to keep connecting with our students and with the world. Thank you. Um... I think it's really great to hear about, you know, the big picture, but also the individual stories are, I think, really crucial to this discussion. And so thank you for bringing that in as well. Um, next up, we have Christina, who's going to talk a little bit about this sort of current moment. Yeah. So I'm so glad that Pernil shared uh, that personal anecdote as far as her, her own daughter um, and thinking about my own experience in the classroom uh, in early childhood and elementary uh, classrooms and then even as recent as late as late January, getting to do a, a read aloud in the kindergarten classroom, which is what you see here, and the joy that we know read alouds can bring. So we already do this, as as we've already mentioned. Um, we know the importance of read alouds and thinking about the why of all of that. So Pernille specifically called out the U.S. Department of Education's thought on on read alouds, as well as her own uh, research and expertise in that. But it does start with the why. So we are in an emergency right now and, and we want to be able to continue that community building and kind of that safe space. And we just have a different platform or a different learning environment that we're doing that right now. But we also know that there are a number of schools that have made the transitions to blended learning or even online learning in online schools for the past 10 to 15 years. And so we've had to consider these cases long before just where we are right now, but it seems that more people are paying attention to it. So it starts with our why, and Pernille's already outlined the reasons why, and uh, for most educators it is for that continuity of, of learning right now, um, but then when we are outside of a pandemic or outside of, a, of an emergency situation, we can certainly think about uh, what read alouds can do for learning and how we contribute to the read aloud itself where we stop and we ask questions and we're giving um, context clues or we're asking students to focus on context clues and really apply their their skill set um, to be able to decode and and comprehend the things that are happening in, in a book but it's not about the tools right now and that's what's really important um, so we have a tendency uh, in the ed tech land to be drawn in by the shiny things. And there are a lot of ed tech providers that are providing a whole slew of different tools right now. And sometimes it just comes down to the basics and going back to what we know. And so it's important to think about our books and whether they are digital or in print and how we are providing that as a tool for our kids that is not something necessarily shiny and new. And so um, being able to use different uh, platforms like Instagram and Facebook and YouTube uh, to be able to share those, those read alouds are certainly important. Um, next slide, please. When we think about uh, moving to an online learning environment, we actually have the opportunity to really think about serving every learner. And this is actually one of my last group of students that I had um, in Omaha, Nebraska. And the majority of my students, I was an English language teacher. Um, and so the majority of my students were newcomers. And this is a group of newcomers that got to experience snow for the first time. And so in order to, like we stopped our lesson, uh, we were in a small group working on reading. And I noticed that it was snowing outside. We ran outside and had the opportunity to experience that for the first time. But then of course we brought that back into the classroom and then we pulled all the books that we had around snow and um, like the science of snow as well as just uh, snow day and poems and, and pieces that accompany that. And so we contribute so much more to um, our students' uh, learning experiences whenever we can add those extra pieces. And so we know that we want that to continue online. 
So we have some of those additional tools, maybe not the shiny, shiny tools. But we have the, the um, capacity to be able to build on what our students are learning through some of these digital tools so that we can scaffold vocabulary, that we can send them to an online dictionary, and that we can show different vocabulary words that they can add to their repertoire um, just because we have access to these tools. We can also think about um, our students that may need to hear things multiple times for it to kind of stick. And so we have the opportunity right now to be able to record some things um, or even just go live and that kids could then um, go back and listen to it again for, for comprehension. And so we have, again, this opportunity to think about this as meeting students where they are and being able to serve every single learner. Thanks, Christina. I think that um, that final point is really important. And just to keep that in mind as we go forward of how we're using um, you know, what we're learning about fair use today and what that enables to make sure that we are really trying to serve everyone um, and meet them where they are. Um, next up, we have Professor Peter Yazzie, who's going to tell us a little bit about sort of the look back at the sort of purposes of reading aloud and how reading aloud practices have related to copyright law. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Meredith. And, and th thank you, Pernil and and Christina, because really you, you as, as will soon become apparent, you've done most of my work for me. And I will turn in a moment to the connection between your eloquent presentations and the, the things we know about the law. First, though, I, I need to utter the four words that, that always drew groans from my own students, and that is, um, first, a, a little history. So if we can look at the next slide, we'll see that the history of copyright in the United States has always been education friendly. And that's in part because we have a copyright law that's based on a constitutional clause that identifies what has come in our time to be called access to knowledge as the primary mission of our copyright system. Now, for most of the history of copyright in the United States, the issues we're talking about today simply weren't on the radar. And that's because for most of that time, uh, non-commercial readings and displays of printed material weren't regulated by copyright law. And under the law as it stood up till 1978, the only performances and displays that to which copyright applied were those that were done themselves for commercial purposes. So in 78, when there was a new copyright law with a lot more detail and some additional protections for rights holders built into it, the Congress realized that there needed to be a generous carve out for a range of different face-to-face -face classroom teaching practices, including, of course, reading aloud, and they designed that law accordingly. So in, in effect, just as was true before 1978, so it continued to be true after, that reading aloud in the physical classroom, the only kind of classroom we had, of course, in that moment was not a regulated activity. Of course, the nature of the classroom changed and what we referred to quaintly back in those days as distance learning became an issue in reality and also in anticipation. And in 2002, the Congress tried to update the law to authorize a variety of uses of copyrighted material in specific terms in the virtual classroom. And the results weren't great. Those of you who've had to grapple with the so-called TEACH Act know that it's confusing and often frustrating. I'm being gentle in my description. Um, it didn't do a good job, in other words, of bringing copyright law up to date for 2002. And it didn't do a very good job at all of anticipating the next 18 years of development, which have been rapid and dramatic 
in so far as the application of new technology to educational practice is concerned. But one very good thing did happen in 2002 as this ultimately unsuccessful amendment was being debated, and that is that the Congress recognized that in addition to looking to the, the specific provisions of what came to be Section 1102 of the Copyright Act, educators could also look in order to justify and, and find a, 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 a legal authorization for their virtual teaching practices to the general fair use doctrine that was codified in Section 107 of the Act. Now that was a, an important coincidence because around the same time, the law of fair use, which isn't just for education, but applies with special force in education, began to change as well. And we've had 25 years of very rapid development in the courts in which fair use has become a more clearly understood and a more useful tool for all kinds of cultural practitioners, including teachers and, as we'll see, librarians. What then does the law of fair use today amount to? Um, Mike, we have the next slide. I should begin this description by saying the, again, what I said a moment ago, this is a really, really good moment in the history of fair use. Fair use has become, over the last 24 years, 20 or 25 or so years, thanks to the courts, easier to understand and especially more predictable. And indeed, quite a lot of what we're going to be talking about later today is an implementation of the very positive developments that have marked the the evolution of the fair use doctrine in the last quarter century. If you look at section 107, which many of you are familiar with, the statutory embodiment of fair use, you'll know, you'll learn that there are four so-called factors listed there. Why are you doing something? What are you doing it to? What kind of material you're using, that is, how much are you using, and what economic effect on the rights holder is your use having. That's what the statute says. It's a comprehensive list and in its own way it's not a, a terribly useful one because the criteria are so broad and the statute is so vague about their relative importance and their interaction that much of the work of trying to understand what fair use really means and how it really applies was thrown back onto the courts. And that's where, as I said earlier, these very positive developments have occurred. Right now, in a situation like the one we're discussing, reading aloud using new technologies in a virtual classroom or a virtual library storytelling, the cases tell us that there, there are really two important functional questions that we need to ask in order to get to a reliable answer, and that is, <clears throat> Are you doing something new and different, something transformative, to use the legal jargon that the courts have developed with the material you're using, and are you providing a, a substitute, a commercial market substitute, for the work as it was originally offered? To be in the best possible position, the answer to the first question should be yes. And the answer to the second question should be no. Now, sometimes in, in fair use analysis, this issue, to which I referred a moment ago, of whether you're using the right amount also comes up. Is the amount you're using appropriate to the purpose for which you're using it? In the case of reading aloud, that isn't often going to be a, a, a dominant issue because generally speaking, of course, the unit, the appropriate unit for a read aloud is going to be the whole book, whether you're reading a picture book at one sitting or a chapter book over the course of a semester. 
Let's see then a little bit more about how all of this applies. We'll take the next slide. And I want to emphasize before I get into the specifics here that there has never been a safer time in terms of risk analysis than the present for educators to engage with the fair use of doctrine, to take advantage of it, to enable their reading aloud practices. And when I say there's never been a better time, I mean, of course, that the conditions of the present emergency change in some ways the, the perspective with which we analyze these questions. I also mean that for all the reasons that I outlined previously, in general, even when the emergency is at an end, this will still be a golden moment for exercising fair use rights responsibly to engage in reading aloud virtually as well as once again, finally, physically. Now it's true that these days, many publishers are opening up their books for limited times and in limited ways for read alouds. That's great, of course, and you should all take advantage of those offers if they suit your needs. But if you look, and I, we've, we've got a, a URL here to an excellent school library journal blog entry, which collects some of these policies, you'll see that they don't cover all the books you want to read and that they are loaded more in some cases, less in other cases, with occasionally onerous and often inconsistent conditions and limitations. And so the, the point that I want to make in, in closing is that although publishers deserve great credit for making this effort, it's also true and important for educators and librarians to remember that none of these temporary licenses limit the scope of your ability to rely on fair use to read aloud online. They don't live in it now and they won't limit it later. And that is because as, as Mike Carroll said earlier, fair use is a statutory right, not a, a concession by rights holders. Now, I'm going to turn things over to Carrie in a moment, but by way of transition, let me say one thing, and that is that when we heard Christina and Pernil talk so eloquently about the purposes of reading aloud, we were actually hearing them develop, articulate the most important premise or proposition for the application of fair use to virtual read arounds. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, the first question you ask in assessing whether a use you're considering is fair is whether it's a transformative use. And as Gary is going to explain, transformative use analysis is a function of what you know and believe and can articulate about the purposes of your activity. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Peter. Um, Carrie will be up next. Carrie, I see that you're unmuted, but I don't know if you're able to unmute your video as well. I have unmuted myself. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Peter. I'm going to talk, as he said, about um, some of the transformative purposes, which you've heard earlier. Um, why the why in education and in libraries these uses are transformative and socially beneficial and then to consider whether or not we're having an impact on the market for the original use that uh, the book or work served. Um, next slide. Reading aloud transformatives and the market. When teachers and students read aloud in the classroom it's a more of an interactive experience that serves a lot of different functions. Um, it's not like silent reading. For example, sometimes when we're reading aloud, we become very, very text specific over a very special part of the book. Um, for English as a second language, for people that are slow readers, highlighting tasks 
text as one speaks aloud, repeating pronunciations is a transformative way of using a work to help people learn. Very different than listening passively to a professional reading for just anybody. Um, in a philosophy class, a student might be invited to share a reading of an essay and the teacher might stop to prompt questions of the audience of the, of the classroom. Again, it's totally unlike reading by yourself, concentrated reading, studying by yourself. Another time you might see um, a reading aloud being used as a textual analysis, not really getting into the expression of the work, but more of how certain words are used. And it's again, it's kind of a different thing than just plain reading. Um, we know that um, just because uh, students hear these read alouds, that does not mean that they're not gonna buy books or buy or not buy um, eBooks. Um, these, these kinds of activities with read alouds do not affect the uh, market for the commercially produced readings. Next slide, please. Now I have to talk about story time because I'm a librarian and as Peter was mentioning, educational uh, uses are pretty special in the copyright law and libraries are the same. We are treated different in the copyright law because we are special sites where people learn and engage with content just as in an educational situation, which is a favored use under copyright. It's really why we have the law to begin with to advance learning. So for many people, for lots of kids, when they, grow to, when they grew up, their parents were available to read to them individually as a child, which is a wonderful thing, um, bonding with your mom or your dad, sharing a story together, wonderful experience. But for a lot of kids, this doesn't always happen. Um, story time at the library can fill a gap. So every, every child can build a love for reading. Um, story time also provides this early community experience and is often interactive and allows children to play roles in the story, which is different than if you're reading just by yourself. I'll re I recall going to um, the main branch of the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Public Library and glancing in a room that was the size of a small parking lot and seeing hundreds of strollers in that room and going, what's going on? Oh, it's story time. There were hundreds of children there for story time. And together, that group of kids made a little community and enjoyed the story together. And the storytellers were able to link the images to the words, which is shown to be a very important part of early media literacy. Um, the other thing about library story time is that libraries select and purchase children's books that are the best for their communities, that reflect the diversity and the life circumstances of their individual com communities. And a library book is, that's purchased for the library is extra special because it has an added social value. When parents come to story time, they discover books that they want to buy from home because if that book was read in the library and if that book was purchased by the library, that means that that book is a quality book and it leads to discovery and more per, uh, purchases. So I see that there's really no impact um, on, the, on, on the work in terms of sales. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and so uh, Carrie's given us sort of this overview of how you take the fair use analysis that Peter sketched out, the sort of basic questions and how you then apply that to this question about reading aloud and thinking through that. Um, and next, we're lucky to have my colleague, Will Cross, who's gonna talk a little bit about, um, sorry, I think there's a slide out of order, Mike, just to the next slide, please, yeah. Talking a little bit about putting the, that theory into practice and thinking through some considerations about how this is done in the school. Thank you very much, Meredith. Uh, thank you all for being here. And thanks to my collaborators for that excellent introduction to the pedagogical values and importance of reading aloud uh, and to sort of the way fair use connects with those issues. I've been charged with talking a little bit about what fair use looks like on the ground for educators and particularly the broad scope and reach of fair use to support reading aloud as a practice. So next slide, please. Fair use covers a, a broad range of materials. Uh, as Peter and Carrie made clear, the core question that fair use asks is about the purpose and character of your use. What are you doing? And why are you doing what you're doing? 
So what that means is when your purpose is transformative, as it often is with reading aloud in the ways that we've already discussed, fair use broadly supports your use, regardless of the type of materials being read aloud. So for example, fair use powerfully supports reading aloud for both fiction and nonfiction texts for narrative or expository purposes. A purchased copy, a library book, a book found online or elsewhere, fair use supports all of those. Um, the integration of texts and illustrations from picture book art to graphs and tables and a STEM material, a STEM book of some sort. Um, and it also supports that reading, whether it's done by teachers or students or others. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we did want to note, though, that when you talk about textbooks and commercial learning materials, um, it's not a no from fair use, but you want to be extra careful because there's a greater risk of that market substitution that Carrie mentioned a minute ago. So fair use covers this wide range of materials with a little sort of an extra eye towards carefulness when you deal with textbooks or commercial learning materials. So that's one way in which the scope of fair use is very broad. Next slide, please. Similarly, fair use covers a wide range of platforms. Um, your fair use analysis is going to be less impacted by the type of platform you select to read aloud on. If you have the option, obviously, it certainly makes sense to read aloud over a platform like a learning management system, an LMS, that is limited to enrolled students or on a YouTube channel that's unlisted in some way to sort of limit the availability beyond the folks that you're trying to support with your pedagogy. And it probably strengthens your fair use analysis, but it's important to say that that limitation is by no means necessary. You might also choose to share your read aloud activities on a dedicated website for the school or uh, hosted by the teacher or even a dedicated YouTube channel. Um, and if you make that choice, it's important to note that developing and using those platforms doesn't create any special obligation to monitor those platforms going forward. So again, it's, it's a wide scope. There's sort of a, a gold star best way to do it. But even if you can't follow that best practice, fair use still gives you a lot of space to do what's best for your students, not just what the lawyers would really like best if they were writing up a brief. Next slide, please. And then a third way that fair use is, gives you broad space to do what's right for your students is that fair use covers a wide range of readers. Um, we've talked a lot about teachers reading aloud and the way that teachers can sort of bring context or make choices, but we want to be clear that just like in the classroom, reading aloud is an activity that can and should be done by a variety of educational participants. Um, teachers reading aloud for the reasons that Carrie, Purnell, and Peter described certainly have a strong fair use claim, but so do students reading aloud, for example, to build and demonstrate fluency. Uh, librarians similarly do reading aloud that's clearly in line with the transformative pedagogical activities supported by fair use. And there are certainly others as well who can and do read aloud in pedagogically valuable ways, uh, such as guest speakers, invited experts, and those sorts of folks. The picture I have here is actually, it's from Scott Air Force Base. Um, there's a program where the enlisted folks come in and they read to individual students who live and learn on the base. It would be hard to argue that that's not also supported by fair use, that sort of reading. Um, so I think that's most of what I wanted to say in terms of the on the ground, the scope of the ability that fair use gives to you. I'm going to turn it over now to Meredith to talk some about some specific practices to think about. Thank you. Um, so I'm always aware that when we do these webinars and um, when we talk to teachers about fair use, there's a, a hunger for sort of concrete yes and no answers. And as Michael Carroll said earlier, you know, we're not your individual lawyers and so we can't give you specific legal advice. But what we think can be very useful is to talk through a set of scenarios that hopefully represent um, questions and practices that you see in your work and talk through what parts of those scenarios can be relevant and to think about sort of what teaching purpose is being served and how are those considerations and questions thought through in these hypotheticals and hopefully that between the sort of fair use background that um, Peter and Carrie gave earlier and the sort of scope that Will just did it, sort of taking that and using it in the context of the purposes that Pernille and uh, Christina talked about and your own teaching purposes can get you to a point where you feel, as Peter said, that there's predictability in understanding when what you are doing is fair use um, and when it may not be. And so in these scenarios, in the um, first five, I'm going to talk through situations in which if you've thought about your purpose and you have a clear understanding of that transformative purpose and um, 
you have done the analysis that these scenarios have many instances that are likely to be fair use. So um, we'll start with the first scenario now. So next slide, please, Mike. Um, so the first practice we're going to talk about is um, when a teacher reads an introductory segment of a nonfiction text, provides students with some background material, and then offers different pre-recorded segments for students to choose to listen to next so they can select their own learning paths. And so here the first question would be, what is our purpose? What is our educational purpose here? And so there's the purpose of getting the students sort of oriented in the text, to model the reading of the beginning, to get everybody on the same page with what you're learning. And then there's a second purpose, which is to allow different um, students to take charge of their learning and to have some control over what they learn next. So it's important to think about not necessarily just replicating what you do in the classroom, but also taking advantage of the flexibility offered online. So students might be able to click through and hear different recorded segments, whereas in class you might just have to read from the beginning to the end. But so in this context, if you're reading it and then sort of transforming it into this student student exploratory work, um, it's if you've got a clear teaching purpose and it's not substituting for having a copy of the text that you would read aloud. Um, and then go on to the next scenario. So this is one of the questions, it's sort of how you translate what you might do in class to this new online environment. So a teacher might regularly begin a class session with a chapter from a novel to orient students in the physical classroom and to get them focused for learning. And you want to adopt, adapt that practice for virtual learning. So as uh, Pernille said earlier, you want to replicate that sense of community and that sort of anchoring in the classroom that you do in person to this new online platform. And so you might do this by posting one chapter per day on a learning management system as an introductory exercise. Um, in the virtual world, you might also um, decide that you wanted to stream this uh, through Facebook or Instagram Live or something like that to get all your students online and paying attention at the same moment. And as Will said earlier, in that situation, if you're doing distribution not through an LMS, you want to make sure that um, you've got a clear sort of community purpose there and that you're targeting those um, Facebook or Instagram links or whatever as closely as you can to your students. And so this isn't a question necessarily of having a strict, it has to be logged in or you have to use some specific rights management. But if your purpose is to create a community around your classroom, then the way you should distribute that should be roughly contiguous with that purpose. Um, on to a next example, we're going to talk a little bit about um, a situation in which you could use some selections from a commercial text. So as Will mentioned earlier, you need to be really careful with um, commercial teaching and learning materials to not um, do things that sort of directly substitute for the original because they're intended to be classroom materials and you're using them in that same way. But that doesn't mean that they're not eligible to be considered for fair use. And so um, one example might be in a middle school classroom, for example, you might read the beginning section of a commercial textbook. You might read a couple of paragraphs and then go through the chapter and highlight areas in the text that you want students to pay extra attention to. You might call out examples. You might read the first few discussion questions aloud. And there, you're doing this transformative thing of providing your students with a roadmap through the text. You're not substituting for them reading directly through that text. Um, and then the next example we'll talk about is we get a lot of questions about reading uh, storybooks to uh, early grade readers. And here, for example, a teacher might read through a book and discuss it with their class and then talk about its connection to a second book and read that out loud. So there, they're providing a context for the books, the connection and explanation for their students. Um, and that purpose is their purpose. We're connecting the two books, we're getting the students thinking, and we're providing the explanation and connection between the teachers and the students. Um, you might also in that situation do a practice for English language learners where you intersperse reading from the book in English with scaffolding questions in a student's home language. So you're providing a really different purpose there 
and helping them build their reading competency. Um, one more example. Uh, so another might be that this is not just practices for teachers. So teachers and students might collaborate to read text in parallel, where students go around and they read pieces to the group, um, contributing to a reading project and sort of building that classroom connection. Um, and again, it's important to think that this, as Will said, is not format dependent. So depending on your student's um, connectivity, depending on their device access, depending on a lot of things, you might do this in an out loud Zoom session, or you might do it in a situation where students recorded themselves and sent it in if that gave them the ability to do work asynchronously, and if it fit your teaching purpose of having the students all experience themselves and their classmates reading to each other. So in all of these situations, if you have a really clear idea of your teaching purpose, either your educational purpose or the community purpose, and it's not directly substituting for the normal market, so this isn't normally how people buy or consume these works, you have a strong fair use justification. Um, another way to think about this here is that the purpose that you, your new transformational purpose can be clear in a couple of different ways. So it can be clear in the, the context of the new thing you've created. So in the example where a teacher is introducing a text and then highlighting pieces, your transformational purpose is sort of clear on the face of that, that you're doing these, this explanatory roadmap, not substituting for reading the text itself. That transformational purpose may also be clear in the audience and the interpersonal connections between the, the reader and the listener. And so as um, I think Pernille and Carrie really highlighted the importance not just of hearing the text spoken, but hearing it spoken in a way that is with someone you have a connection to, with someone in your community, with someone who has anchored it in the context of what you are learning, also serves a transformational, can serve a transformational purpose. So in that context, if you're reading to the students in your classroom, in your school, you're creating this new community context and your educational purpose can be the community tie and the classroom continuity and the interpersonal relationship. Um, and so we've told you a lot about what fair use can do, but it's important to say that you really do need to think this through. And there are things that we should caution you that either fair use doesn't sort of broadly enable or that the specifics really matter and so you have to dig in and be really careful about understanding your purpose and examining whether or not it's substitutional. So let's talk about the first of those cases here. We have the next, oh yeah, great, thanks Mike. Um, so one example that we get that I think is really attractive to people um, is a, an, an instance where a teacher just as sort of a side project or to get a lot of things in one place creates a free personal public YouTube channel where they read picture books out loud and comment on the reading as they go. Um, but it's a wide range of picture books and though they use it in their classroom perhaps, it's also sort of generally promoted as a public resource and isn't specifically them talking to their class or another class in their school and also doesn't um, add a lot of sort of other context to the books. And so, in that situation, you might also have it public, you might post ads. In that broad public YouTube performance, then you need to be really clear about what your purpose is. Because there, you know, you run this real risk of not having a clear enunciated teaching and learning purpose. If you're just doing this because you're like, I think these are generally useful, that's really different. And so in that situation, um, I would caution people that you need to have a, a much sort of tighter focus on what your purpose is there. So I don't think that um, this webinar should be in the sort of guidance taken as sort of, you know, yes, you can do it in all contexts. We've talked up above about very specific um, community and teaching and learning purposes that uh, are different than those of sort of broadly commercially available audiobooks, audiobooks. And here with a sort of public YouTube channel, um, you're getting a little closer to that relationship there. Um, the other practice we want to talk about is, and the next slide is, um, if, for example, 
you just decided that um, instead of purchasing textbooks or other learning materials, you would purchase one copy for your teacher and your teacher would read that out loud and they would you know, read questions from commercial worksheets instead of getting copies to give out to students. And so in that context, if what you were doing is using fair use just to avoid sort of paying for more copies of stuff, that is generally not um, fair use. And so we want to say, if you're just saying, I want to do exactly what the original thing did, and I'm not adding thing, anything except making another copy, then that's often um, not fair use. And what's important to remember as we compare these two practices that we say are less likely to be fair use with the ones at the beginning is to think that it is not about the amount you are using, right? There are a couple of different contexts in the beginning where we say, yes, you're using the whole book, but you're reading it to your students or the students in your school or your community, and you're providing all of the same um, modeling and context and community that you are in the classroom. And in those situations, there are absolutely lots of times where reading the whole book is fair use. And here, if you're not doing that, if you don't have your clear idea of what your educational purpose is, even though you're using the same amount or perhaps less, that if you don't have a really clear grasp on what that transformational educational purpose is, your fair use rationale is less strong. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead and go, we have a, a final word from um, Carrie uh, talking a little, oh, I think that I got moved, sorry. So I'm gonna close out, I guess. Um, so going forward, I think, um, I wanna just go into these questions here. We realize this is a huge transformation for a lot of people. And so um, we've answered questions that were pre-submitted, but there'll be a link sent out after the webinar with a, it's an automatic email from Zoom, but it'll have a link to a uh, form to submit some more questions going forward. We're gonna try to continue an updated FAQ and some um, follow on webinars. So there's some questions we're gonna cover today. And if we don't cover your question, there'll be an opportunity to do that then. Um, but what I wanna focus on as we go into the questions is, as Mike said at the beginning, all of these practices that we're talking about that are core to the teaching and learning relationship between teachers and students are practices that fair use enables um, before the emergency, it enables during the emergency, and there I think the urgency is increased and the risk is lowered, but this is all continues afterwards. And so as we think through um, understanding fair use and understanding how it can improve online teaching and learning, I would just echo a sort of earlier call to make sure that um, we're being brave about understanding copyright law so that we do the best job reaching all of our students, even students who um, may in sort of regular situations have an emergency of lack of access. So students with disabilities, students who have a illness that causes them to miss school, and students in other vulnerable, po vulnerable populations who may not have the same access to um, reading aloud materials or the same ability to attend in-person school reliably. So that being said, we have a number of questions that um, I'm going to read out loud for everybody on the phone and then we will um, go ahead and uh, talk through uh, the answers and then um, we'll have a brief moment at the end for everyone to follow up. So let's start with the first question. Uh, the first question was someone who wrote that I would love a clear yes no answer as to whether or not it's fair use to read a book aloud and post on a closed platform such as Google Classroom or Schoolology and to delete at the end of the year regardless of publisher. The information that has come out so far is very confusing and complicated when each publisher has different rules. And so there's two parts to this question. Um, the first question is, is it fair use to do this thing? And the question is, is it fair use to read this whole book out loud and post it on a closed platform? Um, and as we just said, you have to have a good idea of why you're reading that book out loud. So if you're reading it out loud because you um, want to continue the teacher-student relationship that you had in the classroom, and because you would normally read this book about frogs to introduce your frog lesson in person, 
and now you are doing that same work online and so you want to read it to get students thinking about frogs and you want them to get them thinking about pond ecology and you would have done that in the classroom and now you're doing it online then yes in those situations you have a strong fair use argument for that and you have a reasonable idea here about how you're going to deliver that material to your audience. Um, the other questions that are there, you know, should you delete at the end of the year? What are the, how do you evaluate these publisher policies are really actually a separate branch because um, as you heard earlier, when you think about, can I do this thing? The question of, do I have permission is really, you don't have to get to that question if the first answer is I have the right to do this under fair use. And so um, as you think through what you can do, it's important to remember that if you have the ability under fair use to do something, it doesn't matter what permission you have been given. Um, the flip side of that is if you have clear permission to do it, you don't have to dig into the fair use analysis, but those two don't affect each other just because what you think you can do under fair use is different than what someone has given you permission to do. It doesn't mean that you can't do that. Those two run um, sort of in parallel. And so not to take up all the time, we're going to go on to the next question. And the next question is for uh, Peter, which is, would reading several chapters of a chapter book qualify as fair use? Thank you, Meredith. Um, this has been um, listening to my my fellow participants has been in a, in a way an education in itself today because what we've heard about in 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 every presentation has been the the range and and breadth of the different positive value added uses that teachers and librarians and students um, engage in through reading aloud. And I, I hope that if, if there is one message that has come through these presentations, it is that transformative use, that concept that is the key to contemporary fair use analysis, comes in many, many varieties and flavors. And we've heard about some of them today, and I hope that as we carry on and as you, you, you help us by submitting additional questions, we will be able to consider and, and highlight still others. This is an interesting question because it goes to the issue of purpose. There is no categorical answer to this question. It depends on why you're doing it. But let's say, for example, that you are reading a chapter book to your students as a way of, as, as a, ter a, a term that I've learned in the, in the last few days that, that seems very uh, important to me, reading them into the class, building a community of expectation and of, of, of shared enjoyment which connects students who may have different backgrounds and different abilities together as a community. Well, that is a transformative purpose. And if we query the other fair use criterion that I mentioned earlier that we've been rehearsing since, is this going to be a, a significant substitute for the the purchase of volumes or commercial ebooks or even um, commercial audiobooks, I think we all know that in almost every imaginable classroom setting, the answer to that question is going to be no. So let's go back then to the phraseology of the question. Would reading several chapters of a chapter book qualify as fair use? The answer, I think, is likely, depending on purpose, to be yes. And moreover, if the answer is yes, then it is difficult or impossible to understand in terms of the sort of fair use analysis that we have been modeling for you today, why the whole book parsed out in chapters 
would not also be eligible to read aloud online in a chapter by chapter rendition. Thank you, Peter. Um, and so if we could go to the next question, it would be if someone records a Zoom discussion and copyright material is discussed or read aloud in full, such as like a poem, for example, would that be permitted? And Peter, I think this question would also be for you if you're capable to uh, come back on and unmute. Of course, and it's a wonderful question because it implicates several different uh, underlying issues. One thing that, one question that uh, a number of you have asked in advance of the webinar and that is incorporated here is, all right, maybe it's okay to do these things live, but, but can we record them and make those recordings available to our students, the ones who may not be in class, the ones who may want to watch again, the ones who would benefit from a, an opportunity to view this content asynchronously? And the answer to that question embedded, so to speak, in this one is, of course, as we've tried to explain, the fair use analysis that we've been modeling is largely, although not entirely, independent of the kind of material being read or shown and largely, if not entirely independent of the particular medium that is being used to make it available. And that means that potentially a recording uh, or a recorded session designed for the use of students would be as eligible as a live one. Now, here we have another example of an entire, let's say, an entire work being used. But of course, the fact that a, a literature class, let's say it's a, let's say it's a, you know, it's a, it's a high school um, English course. Let's, the fact that a literature class in which the goal of the class session is to critique or to break down or to interpret a poem necessarily involves the reading of the poem itself. Well, that's a, a, a almost a kind of classic garden variety, non-controversial example of fair use. And I mentioned something else too in connection with this question, and that is that especially in the in this time of emergency, but even beyond this time of emergency. I also think it's probably just fine for the teacher in this case to distribute the text of this poem to facilitate in advance to facilitate the online reading and discussion. Fair use has a lot of flexibility and it's that flexibility that makes it particularly attractive in contrast or comparison to some of the more specific exceptions of copyright law, like, for instance, the, the provisions of the Teach Act that I was mentioning earlier. Thank you, Peter. Um, and our next question um, is for uh, Carrie Russell. And so for Carrie, we're going to ask the question of, you know, do you need to wait for an approval response from a publisher before doing your reading out loud? Thank you. The answer to the question is no. If you have decided that your use is a fair use, there's no need to contact the publisher to begin with because you've made that determination and fair use is a right that you should exercise. Now, if you do ask a, a publisher for permission, you might not hear back from them. They may never reply. They may reply and say, no, you can't do this. But again, it's not something that should change your fair use determination. I always think of it when I'm talking to librarians and educators is that you approach fair use from the position of what you are trying to achieve as a mission in your library or in your school. You know what you're doing more than the publisher knows what you're doing. You know why you need to use the materials and you know what the goal is. 
um, you might talk to a publisher who has absolutely no idea of what you do in your school. They might have absolutely no idea what fair use is. So there's no need to wait for approval from a publisher before doing your reading if you have already determined that your use is fair. Thanks, Carrie. And we have a follow-on question for that. We can see the next slide, which is, is there a special way we need to give credit to authors or publishers when we read a book out online? This is not a copyright question, but really more of an ethical kinds of kind of consideration. And I feel that you always should give credit to the author or to uh, provide the bibliographic information that acknowledges the publisher whenever you use any protected work, whether online or in your classroom or on course reserves. It's just a good idea to give people the fact, the facts that these ideas and materials came from these people and you wanna acknowledge that work that they did do. Um, you also, it's um, just part of like being a good uh, scholar or a good student to always cite where you get your material. So I think it's definitely a thing that you should do. Is there a special way that you should do it? I think that's up to you. I think what makes um, things most understandable for your listener or your reader is the best thing to do. Um, you don't have to do all kinds of fancy legal language or anything like that. You can just say, this is the author, this is the publisher. You can get this book from this library if you want, or you can get it online from this publisher. So that's the kind of thing that I think you always should do and do it in a way that makes sense to the people that are receiving that message. Great, thanks. Um, and up next, we'll have Will with the next question which says, what about recording a read aloud session and emailing it to the individual students in a class? Thanks, Meredith. So as we've discussed already, if there's an option where you can retain some control of the recording and explicitly situate it in the educational context, like an LMS, that's probably best practice in some sense. But if that's not available for some of the reasons Meredith talked about before because of their issues of bandwidth, because it's not possible for your students, etc. There's nothing in fair use that limits your ability to record or read aloud ahead of time and email it to individual students in the course, as long as the purpose is supporting the transformative sort of stuff that you're doing. Um, and you're sort of doing best practice. So going back to that North Star of what's the purpose that you're doing that for. Thanks, Will. And I think I'm going to take um, moderator privilege to just add one comment to that that it's really important right now. Um, you know, we've talked about how these practices are, are really uh, enabled for schools and for teachers in general. They're not um, something that you're allowed to do just because it's an emergency right now. But one thing I would say, it is particularly important right now to make sure that you're not letting caution about, for example, keeping something carefully closeted within an LMS, you're not letting that caution keep you from reaching all of your students. So if you already had an LMS set up and all your students had devices and they were regularly used to accessing that, that's a really good distribution channel. But if you know that your students mostly don't have LMS logs in, logins and they are using you know, their parents' phones, or they're using a, a computer in a library, or and libraries are closed now, but they're using intermittently accessible materials, that in those situations, you should absolutely feel like fair use enables you to do what you need to do to reach those students. And if that's emailing, or if that's having something that might be on an unlisted YouTube channel instead of a private one, those things are, are enabled and it's really important that you're putting the the goal of reaching all of your students um, up at the top of that fair use analysis. Does that seem fair well? Yeah, yeah, I think that's such a good point. I've, I've talked to somebody yesterday who's parking in the parking lot of buildings to borrow their Wi-Fi for a little bit, right? So, so how do you reach that student in this time of crisis in particular? But how, we know there are students who wrestle with that all the time. So what do you need to do to connect with your students is the touchstone for sure. Right, and so I think if you've made that fair use analysis that says, yes, I can do it over the LMS, and you hear from a student that's like, I can't stay logged in, I need to have a copy I can download, you shouldn't feel like fair use ties you into one technological route. Absolutely. Um, so the next question after I've derailed Will on that is, um, does it matter what source material you're using for read aloud, whether it's a personal copy or a library copy or an ebook? 
And the answer there is it does not. Uh, I think this question comes from the fact that there are a lot of copyright exceptions that do have something to say about that, right? Section 108, the library exception talks about from the collections in different ways. Section 110 talks about a lawfully acquired copy. So there are places in the Copyright Act that they ask that question specifically, what's the source of the material? Fair use is not one of those places. Fair use asks that why question that we've talked about. Um, and if your use is transformative in the ways that we've talked about, um, you're in good shape. Thanks, Will. Um, and so let's go on to the next question, which is, um, we had a question from someone who said that their concept was to have poets read their own poems or a poem of their choosing, which would focus on fostering a connection amidst the loneliness and social distancing of COVID-19. Their audience would be adult and young adult patients at their hospital. Their platform would be Facebook. Um, and so the question here is, what if you don't have a teacher reading? What if you have someone else, a guest, like a poet reading another's work? And so this is a question that sort of broadens the scope a little bit. And so we're gonna call on our deep expert bench and ask Peter to answer that. Thank you, Meredith. I should say that, that reading, reading all of the questions that were, were submitted in advance, many of them, very, very poignant. This was perhaps the one that really grabbed my heartstrings. The 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 question is being asked on behalf of a of a, a, a small library embedded in a large medical center, and this is a program that they are imagining for the moment in which we all now find ourselves. And embedded in it, I think, are, are a lot of the points that, that we have been talking about in the, the, the last few minutes. So the first thing that I want to emphasize in, in thinking about, not so much in giving the answer to the question, because although we could do that, and, and, and I will suggest what my view is in a moment, the real point of this webinar, of course, is to help you to become more confident and more um, more engaged in thinking through these issues for yourselves and making good decisions, which at least in the present moment will also be low risk decisions. So it isn't a conventional audience. It's not students and it's not a, a a group of attendees at a at a regularly scheduled public library read aloud, both of which we've talked about. Here we are talking about an audience of adult and young adult hospital patients. And the goal isn't to teach a lesson as it would be in the case of a a a school-based online read aloud. It is to, as the questioner put it better than I can, address the, the loneliness and isolation that both hospitalization and social distancing uh, in, uh, in, in generate. Is this kind of building of a community, is this kind of addressing through an activity the 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 fears and anxieties of the temporary community of of hospital patients a transformative purpose if 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 i if we could do it i would ask for a show of hands and if if i will predict that we would get an overwhelming uh response favoring this as a transformative use. So then we have this question of platform. Is Facebook in, in the normal circumstance the best vehicle for engaging a reading community in a read aloud activity? Maybe not. Um, we've already talked about some reasons why that might be so, although obviously there are ways of managing a Facebook distribution or a Facebook performance that are more in ways that are less conducive with fair use. But the point here 
is the point Mill made so well earlier on, and that is the in this in this case the the best is the enemy of the good. Facebook is what is available. The purpose is clearly a transformative value, a transformative value added purpose, and the likelihood that there is going to be some kind of competition for the 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 booming mar in the booming market in pre-recorded read alouds of poetry is small. So then we have the last question: Does it matter who's the reader? And here we've already addressed the question, but I want to make the point literally uh, extremely clear. It's great for teachers to do read-alouds. It's great for librarians to read aloud, do read-alouds. And it's great for guests to the classroom, the physical classroom, and in this case, the virtual lab classroom, or guests in the library. In this case, the, the poets who are going to select and read aloud and in so doing interpret, since every read aloud is an interpretation, one another's work, they are fully qualified. So again, th this, this example moved me when I read it, and uh, I hope that the, the, co the, the confidence building function that, that we have intended for this webinar will make it possible to go forward in in this in this enterprise with a with 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 no anxiety and a and a and a you know head held high thank you peter um so we really have one last question and we have um two panelists who will sorry next slide please uh two panelists who will uh take that in turn and um the question is, do you predict that current copyright concerns over sharing books online will shift due to COVID-19 circumstances? In other words, since we have to share online to do our jobs and to serve our educational mission, which benefits society, you know, will this sort of broaden our interpretation of fair use? And so to talk about sort of the current moment and then the emergency going forward, we have first um, Christina Ishmael, and then we'll have uh, Prue Adler. So Christina, please go ahead. Yeah, I think this goes back to um, thinking about serving every student. So this certainly applies again in, in this instance, whether we're in an emergency, whether we're applying blended learning techniques or even online learning or online schools uh, more specifically, um, that we are serving all students and every student for that matter. I also think that this is a great conversation starter and kind of starting point for um, talking about copyright, fair use, and, and creative commons with educators in general. So this comes up a lot in the trainings that I do. I know it comes up in trainings that you do, Meredith, with, with educators. Um, but we need to start having these conversations not only with in-service teachers, but also with pre-service teachers so that we can reach out to colleges of education to, to address this um, so that educators have more confidence in being able to say, going through the four factors of fair use and really making sure that they are um, are you know using transformative kind of practices when they're doing things online um, or even in the classroom so um, I don't know if it necessarily changes uh, the interpretation of fair use necessarily but I think that it certainly could empower us as educators to have more confidence in having these conversations thank you Christina um, and uh, Prue, I know you have been a partner with us on this project and have worked specifically on a lot of issues of equity and access, and I wanted to see if um, you wanted to speak for a moment about your perspective on that. Oh, sure, and thank you very much, Meredith, and thank you for everybody. It's been, as Peter mentioned, really educational and illuminating this afternoon, and I guess what I, I wanted to sort of close with, in, in part, was as you've heard all this afternoon, um, fair use is already very broad and it permits many of the social and educational benefits to users and to you alike. Um, and I think we all want to bring that home in that it's not necessarily that it's going to be broadened. It already is very broad and allows you to do many of the things that you need to do both today in this current situation and going forward. Um, I think 
the key goal here is equitable access for all learners um, so that exercise and care use is very fundamental to achieving this goal. And I'd give you one example, and Peter and others can go into more in depth about it, but there was a court decision um, within the last several years that allowed access to a very large, millions of volumes of digitized works, a digital repository called Hoffley Trust, which strongly supported access to these texts for educational reasons. In particular, it noted the importance of access to this digital library, digital repository, for those who are digitally impaired. And so I think that it's not only that fair use empowers you to do the kind of work that you want to do for your students and your members of your community, but it also supports those learners at very different levels with very different um, achievement levels in ways that empower and embrace the fair use uh, provisions that you should take advantage of. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to embellish on that, but I think that is something extremely important um, to look at equitable access for all learners as you consider the fair use provisions in the context of your individual case, your individual setting. Thank you so much, Prue. I don't think we could have anyone uh, better than you to close out that question. And so, um, but there we could just go to the last slide. Um, I wanna say, I think, you know, as Prue had, had mentioned there, and as uh, we've talked about throughout, um, fair use enables a really wide range of the practices you need to transition to online learning and to serve all of your students. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the discussion around this comes out of, I think, a really strong sense of responsibility uh, from teachers and librarians to understand and follow the rules. And I think that's really admirable, but I would encourage um, teachers and staff and librarians to think about understanding those rules and taking advantage of them, not of staying sort of 10 steps back, because I think you really leave a lot of important um, teaching and learning opportunities on the table, on the shelf, as it were, if you don't take advantage of the um, freedom that fair use intends to provide for educators. Uh, to really engage with existing materials. So um, we hope this has been useful. The URL that is displayed on the screen is the URL for the guidance document. Um, in the bottom of that first page, it has a link to um, the Pidgeup YouTube channel where this will be archived. It has a link to the question form where you can submit ongoing questions. It also has a link to the bios for all the presenters. And so as we go forward, we know that we haven't answered all of the questions. We also cannot answer individual questions, but we can continue to do um, webinars and put out FAQs and help you guys as you build this airplane that is in flight. And so um, please continue to submit questions. You'll get a follow-up email tomorrow um, through Zoom that has all this information, but it is also at this URL right now. The slides are actually not up there yet, but they will be shortly. Um, I also know that as we talked through this, um, we addressed some questions for libraries, but might try to address sort of other library specific questions going forward if there's demand. So feel free to put those questions in as well. Um, I wanna say such a deep thank you to those of you who took an hour and a half to talk about copyright law um, and to all of my co-presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Will. Oh, you're muted, Peter. Let me unmute you. Just wanting to add and, and say again to, to everyone who spent this time with us, thank you very, very much. <laughs>